Hello. Hello. Nice to see you, Lucy. I love your book. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> welcome, welcome. <laughs> checking that I have my microphone on <laughs> that I am recording and that video is working so welcome Katya Anna and Mary and I have no idea if more people will be joining us normally I check in with Lee to see how many people are signed up and I didn't do that this time which was stupid and um I kind of only thought to actually share it on my own social media today because you know who needs to promote something anyway so <laughs> we're here for now and um i will be letting people in as they come in so welcome welcome please make sure you have a pen and paper if you've got colors that would be great too um but yeah i i feel like it's a very odd one normally for those of you who come to our other book clubs normally I'm talking to one of our authors and I'm asking them questions and I get to kind of then sit there and shut up whereas I've got to fill the time myself so it's going to be a bit of a different kind of feel to it this time there'll be more um more interactive stuff more exercises than there normally would be um because listening to me talking for an hour would not be fun so I am going to start with a little reading from Creatrix. Um, starting with perhaps the most obvious thing, but it's something that people ask me again and again, which is what the hell's a Creatrix, Lucy? <laughs> and why would we want to use the word Creatrix? Um, for some people it's, it's not new, but for lots of people it is. So the definition of Creatrix is a female who brings forth or produces, a female founder, authoress, or creator. It's from the classical Latin, 
creatrix, meaning mother, creatress, authoress, feminine form corresponding to creator. And the first usage was in 1620. So it is not a modern term. This is what I have to say about discovering and owning the uh, word creatrix. My sense is that the archetype of creatrix is a more accessible concept for creative women as they reclaim the full spectrum of their creative powers and voices, rather than trying to fit themselves into the archetypes of artist or creator, which have been forged in the male image for so long. Because the term has so little cultural baggage, we can own creatrix and define it for ourselves. Self-definition is the ultimate reclamation of our power from oppressive forces, both inner and outer. It can help us to make psychological and energetic space for ourselves to create in our own words and images in our own way, with our own intentions. It can allow us to more feel, freely incorporate our values, feelings and priorities into our creative work. Does what we call ourselves really matter? I believe it does. does. How we define ourselves with words shapes our actions. How we think and feel informs what and how we create. Once we own the label of creatrix, it becomes an innate part of our identity, rather than creating just being another activity on our overlong to-do list. Identify with a role unlocks latent energy within us. And that, for me, is the point in giving terms like creatrix or burning woman names because so often these parts of ourselves have been unspoken and unspeakable we haven't been able to bring them to mind for ourselves often because we haven't had people to show us what that looked like so often we grew up with frustrated mothers grandmothers or aunts who couldn't express themselves creatively, who were forced into domestic roles, who were forced into labor outside the house and weren't able to actually inhabit the fullness of their creative expression. I want to do a little exercise with you, which I did when I, I gave a talk on Creatrix to the Witches Revival last year. And it never ceases to amaze me, in part because I have studied the arts all the way through to A-level, degree, post-degree. And still, I struggle with this. So I'm just curious. You can either do it in the chat or you can do it um, on paper for yourself. I'm going to ask you some categories of people. And I'd like you just to see if you can name some people. See how easy or hard it is. Okay, we'll go for one free 20th century male artist. How quickly can you do that? One male free 20th century artist. One male pre 20th century composer. One male pre 20th century playwright. One male pre 1980, tricky, film director. Now they can still be directing now, but that they had a film before 1980. One male pre-20th century poet.
and two male pre-20th century authors. If I haven't said that already, I don't think I did. All right, so what I saw in your faces was momentary, oh, sugar, and then you just got them. You just got them down, done. Probably because you learned about them in school, however long your arts education went on in school. Probably because every time you go to a gallery or a library or uh, the cinema or anywhere where there's any art form, you'll be seeing them. You'll be seeing their names. They'll be named endlessly for you. So although I'm putting you on the spot, actually, they're there like that. You ready to really challenge the old brain now? Here we go. One pre-20th century female playwright. I mean, shall I come back to you tomorrow? <laughs> One female pre-20th century artist, visual artist. Painter. One pre twentieth century female composer. I mean, really, I could come back to you next year, and I think we still might not have one. Female, pre-20th century, author. Now, if you have written down Jane Austen, any of the Brontes, Mary Shelley, or George Eliot, cross them out and try again. <laughs> right? That's how few we have. That's how few are in the mainstream lexicon of female authors, pre-20th century. Okay. Poet, female, pre-20th century. What we got? Oh, and now if you've got Emily Dickinson or Christina Rossetti. And finally, film director, 20th century, before 1980, so we can't have Greta Gerwig. Bad luck. I'm not going to be able to help you on this. <laughs> hmm. So, I'm really curious. Can you, uh, we'll just go for craziness, seeing as like, there's so few of us here. Unmute yourselves if you want to and just yell them out to me. Let's see if we do actually have any. So playwright, female playwright, do we have any? No. Okay, there we go. Artist, do we have any? Brett Mariso. Okay. Right. Um, composer. I mean, I could tell you 15 male ones and I'm not even into classical music. Okay. Um, Authors beyond those five I named? Maria Edgeworth. Ooh, very good. Okay. Um, film director? Nope. Poets. And that, yeah, okay. no one. that ladies, <laughs> is a perfect illustration of patriarchy in our education system and in culture and if you gave that test to anybody they would come out like that unless they were a specialist in a field and that is why we need to create creatrix in our own image because we do not have a her story of creative women who are well known to us, who have seeped into our souls. We are constantly seeking them out. 
And when we find them, we tend to pass them on like kids kind of swap Pokemons and stuff. Like it's that thing of, oh my goodness, I didn't know Hildegard von Bingen existed. Everyone has to know about her. And it's that, and it's tragic. And until I do that exercise with people, if I just start saying, you know, nobody really, you know, there aren't many female people who we can model ourselves on in whatever field of the arts we're in. It sounds whingy and it sounds like, mm, you know, feminist is moaning again. But actually, that is how little we have to draw on from our wellspring of examples of women who live the creative life in their own image. Women's images, women's experiences of the world through women's eyes, through women's voices, through women's hands. We do not have that. And so that is why I am so passionate about the work I do. And yes, I was asking us to do pre 20th century. Things shifted in the 20th century. Things are continuing to shift in the 21st century. But that is what our education is rooted in. That is what our soul image is, our idea of what it means to create and who gets to create. That is what we were brought up in. And you can't get rid of that because that's what the roots go down into. So, right. Why did I write <laughs> Creatrix? The honest answer is that I wrote Creatrix as a, <laughs> to my former publisher. <laughs> um, and I wrote Creatrix because I wanted to make an income from a book that I wrote that was very, very good and that sold very, very well, which I got very, very little money from the publisher from. So I wanted to take the stuff that was really valuable and of use and original from there and broaden it out because many women got onto me who had read my book, The Rainbow Way, Cultivating Creativity in the Midst of Motherhood, and they wanted to share it with people who weren't mothers, but there was too much mother content. And I was like, yeah, fair enough, because I wrote that as my personal response to um, The Artist's Way, which I had read as a new mother and found myself missing from, because most of her examples were male examples, and most of the things she was talking about was in the light of the 12 step addiction recovery process, which is not part of my lexicon. It wasn't part of my experience and it was very American. And so all of those things, I was like, you know what? I've been starting to talk to other creative mothers about this incredible urge that we felt at some point during pregnancy or after birth, this creative urge that poured through us nothing had prepared us for, nothing in our culture had said anything about. And so it was written for us. We who were walking that path at that moment, small child on hip, frustration building in our chests, nervous breakdowns just shimmering only a, a breath away because we weren't getting expression for that part of ourselves and no one seemed to think it mattered. And nobody had warned us that this would happen. And so we were left feeling entirely crazy. And so I wrote and spoke about the crazy woman and the creative rainbow mother, both of whom I, um, the archetypes that I learned about via Lynn V. Andrews in her books, um, especially Medicine Woman and Jaguar Woman. And then through the work of Leonie Dawson, who had written um, a blog post about the creative rainbow mother. And that was all I could find. Like there was nothing else on those archetypes. So that was my call to action to write what it was from my experience to gather a tribe of creative mothers who were experiencing that too. And then to gather a kind of a, a kind of a blueprint or a way forward that was less prescriptive than the artist's way, that was more understanding of the limitations of time and energy and aloneness that mothers of young children have. And so that was the focus of that. 
and it was a really popular book and it did very very well I it was my first book published by anybody else I'd self-published a couple as it was going around publishers waiting to be published and when it was in its first week it was there and it beat um super nanny I don't know if you know super nanny but she puts children on the naughty step and she shames them and at times in my mothering journey I longed for super nanny to come and help me but most of the time I wasn't a huge fan of her so to knock her off her spot at the top of Amazon was very very gratifying so that was the rainbow way and that was the seeds and the roots of creatrix but the rainbow way was written 2010 2011 and creatrix i'm pretty sure came out 2018 2019 so there was a lot of learning in between those two times i'd established myself as an author in the meantime um, I'd started Womancraft Publishing. I'd befriended and talked to an awful lot more creative people. And so I really felt like there was there was a lot there that I'd shared on my blog, that I had learned myself, that I wanted to share onwards, and that it didn't have to be connected to motherhood. I'd been there, I'd done that, that was there for the me of times past and all who needed it then and this was just for women and I really one of the things I really struggled with it was I wanted to make it for everybody I like this was going to be my creativity for everybody book and I got a couple of men to uh you know su submit contributions but what I felt was there wasn't that hunger there there wasn't that desperation to be seen to be heard that there was in the women's contributions that I was getting and so I thought you know what I mean they got the whole uh, <laughs> western <laughs> cultural history there for them to tap into I think this can just be for the women so that's what I did um and it has been an incredibly popular book I mean in part just because of the cover. I just, that is one of my favorite pieces of art I've ever done. I just, the color makes my soul sing. Um, my husband uh, was, who does the layout for books and stuff, was right up until the moment it was published, trying to get me to take part two out and publish that as a separate book. Because it's a thick book, which means it's a heavy book, which means it's flipping expensive to spend. And most of our books are sold online. Now, if it's sold via Amazon, postage isn't our problem. But when it's sold by us, this is an expensive book to send. So the postage is um, is a tricky thing. But for me, I didn't want to cut it in half because if you've read it the whole way through, you'll know that the first half is about the theory of creativity, how and why we create, what the creatrix is, what creativity means, blah, blah, blah. The second half is the practical bit of creativity, putting our work out into the world and making money from it. And especially for female creatives, those two have been pulled apart. Women haven't been able to make a living from their creative work for the vast majority of our history. And women struggle hugely with putting a value on their work because as women, we've been brought up to give our labor freely and so we struggle to put a price or a value on what we create and then we struggle to make money from it and then we struggle therefore to have time to do this creative work because we're not making any money from it so we've got to do other work to support ourselves you see where the problem is so i was like now nah, i'm not going to break that in two the two bits have to be together and they have to come together in this book here because you don't have to make your living out of your creativity at all. But if you are driven by this create or die urge that I call it, and I still have it really strongly, then the chances are you're probably going to be happier if you are making your living in some way creatively rather than giving all of your energy to something else that doesn't really matter so much to you. So that is a bit of backstory. <laughs> So, I was wondering 
if you would like to make a labyrinth with me. Because on the front of the book is a labyrinth and the labyrinth is the guide for the creative way in both the rainbow way and in Creatrix. And it's an uh, image that a lot of women are drawn to, but they don't know how to draw. So if you do know how to draw one, you'll find this super easy and then you can get into decorating it and making notes on it and doodling on it. Um, I'm going to show you my favourite labyrinth to make. Um, I'm going to pop this onto that. All right. So get your piece of paper and then in the centre of your piece of paper, you're going to make a large Y. Excuse my squeaky chair. I swapped desk chairs with my um, son and I've now got a squeaky chair. <laughs> which is pretty bad when you're recording a podcast. And then you do a V oops, sorry, inside each of those angles, echoing those angles. Then over the top of the angle, so opposite the angle that you've got there, make a dot. So opposite the angle, make a dot. Opposite the angle, make a dot. Okay, then starting, and I'm aware that this might look back to front to you because um, because the camera can sometimes turn it around. So I'm going from the top dot and I'm going over, joining up to the left hand arm of the small angle bit. Now I'm doing this left-handed, so you might want to do it the other way around. So, then we go from this corner here, oops, this one here, and we curve it around to meet the right hand arm of the Y. Then we go from the left hand arm of the Y all the way around, trying to keep equidistant until we join up with the top arm of that right hand. Then we go from this top hand of that angle over to the dot, the right hand side. Then we go from the dot on the left over the top. You see it's starting to take shape now and you're not even having to concentrate. And it joins up to the bottom of that angly bit that was there, not the Y, the little angle that was there. Next, this is the last one. We go from the bottom of the left hand angle around to reach bottom of the Y and join it up. And there you have your labyrinth. So, what I would suggest you do now is to just use your finger and just trace the path of the labyrinth for a second. As you pause outside before you start, think of your intention for your own creativity at this moment. It might be something that you are working on at the moment. It might be a dream that you're calling in. It might just be that you get more time or space to create. Whatever your intention is, just stay there for a second outside and then trace your finger in slowly, tracing the path of the lab. And when you reach the center, pausing for a second, closing the eyes, breathing in and out. Settling into the body. And think of something that you would like to let go of. 
something that you don't need to carry back with you on the journey out. Maybe it's allowing the inner critic to be cruel or controlling. Maybe it's limiting the amount of money that you spend on materials. Maybe it's limiting the time you allow yourself to create. Whatever that limitation is, that restriction that you currently experience in your creativity. Just saying to yourself, I release whatever you want to release. And then when you feel ready, tracing the path back out. So I invite you, at the threshold of it, you might want to place a pebble shape. And in that, put a symbol or a, a word to represent something that blocks your entry into the creative process. A block that you have, a creative block and just write it down there. And then around the outside, maybe in lovely different colors, write all the words that you associate with your creativity, positive words that you get when you create the experiences, the feelings that you experience when you create. You may well just want to listen to the colors and see which color wants to be which word. They usually have a feeling about that sort of thing. Then at the very center of the labyrinth, you might want to just do a little symbol of how you imagine the creative process, something that represents your creativity to you, something that reminds you of why you create. And you might want to you know, do a nicer version of this in your own time, in the materials that you love. But it's really handy to have a visual representation of what it is that keeps us from our creativity. A remembering that the creative process is always a two-part thing. There's the going in towards the work and the discovery. And then there's the going out towards the world with what you've created. And that both of those parts are a vital part of the creative process. And at the heart of it, there is there is a treasure, there is a magic, there is a something, which is what you're always seeking for. And then around the outside, there's just those reminders of why it is that you walk that path, even when you can't see what's ahead of you, even when you don't know where you're going, even when it feels overwhelming and scary and too much. You have this memory that even if you can't see, because you never can, you can never see how it's going to end up. You can never predict that. 
but there's this kind of trust that there is a path leading us. There is a path leading our feet that we don't have to worry about. We don't have to constantly second guess ourselves. We don't constantly have to worry. And that we can allow the inner critic just to take a back seat as we walk this creative way into the center to find whatever treasure it is we're looking for. And then to have the courage and strength to bring it back out to share it with the world. So, I feel like this might be a good moment to ask, does anybody have any questions? No questions. I had a, I had a really specific question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, because I started reading the book a few months ago and then, um, and I read the first section um and got as far as process and then because I'm kind of more at that stage of um wanting to be doing something but haven't quite got into it so then I stopped and then I moved house and I packed the book and I only took it out again yesterday so I was cramming <laughs> and kind of trying to speed read a bit more of it before I spoke to you but then there was one in one section it was talking about being um and I really like the questions that you have for the creative inquiry at the end of the sections. I found they're really like prompt me in different directions of thought, which was really helpful. And in fear and courage, it was how can you center your creativity rather than yourself? And I wondered what that meant. I put a big question mark on my piece of paper because I was like, what does she mean? So I know it's very specific. <laughs> but... Right. Before I answer, I guess I'm going to ask you, what do you think I mean? What does that mean to you? I was wondering about like your, like what your conception of yourself is, like how you think about yourself versus how you think about um, like your creativity, which doesn't sound, but like, are they separate or what do you like, you know, I don't know what's getting in the way or yeah. Okay, so for me, like, it's a really good question. <laughs> for me, I see the creativity as something that I channel through me. So I don't see it as something that is of me. It takes bits of me as it comes through. So it's shaped by my experiences, by what I love what I'm looking at at the moment, all of those things shape and channel it. But there is this creative energy that comes through me that doesn't feel like it's of me. It feels much bigger than me. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean when I say that is the reasons I resist creating are because I feel too small. I feel not enough. I feel scared of other people looking at me and criticizing me. And I call that little Lucy. That's me who, you know, grew up in this world and was bullied and never fitted in and all of those things. And those things keep me small and they keep me very scared. And that me doesn't want to be seen. That person wants to shut down hide and will probably have quite a miserable life mm. and then there's this thing that calls to come through me which is big and colorful and loud and can be shocking and is thrilling and terrifying and wonderful and enormous and if I decide what to center, if I center me, little Lucy, I ain't letting that thing through because uh -uh, I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm going to have to be there. You know, I'm going to be the one who's being looked at. So scrub little Lucy from it. Take care of myself day to day as best I can and center the creativity that's longing to come through. 
So I put my focus on that rather than on my feeling of smallness and fear. And so when I put my focus on that, how can I allow that to come through? How can I play with that? How can I enjoy that? How can I get pleasure from that? How can I connect to other people through that? That's a really lovely place to be in. So I keep having to shift my focus from that feeling of contraction, smallness, fear, anxiety, isolation, to one of expansiveness and connection and playfulness and thrill. And so for me, that is what I mean by that. I center that creative energy rather than the persona that is Lucy. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't kind of thought about, like for me, when I was thinking about creativity, I was thinking about it all mushed up, you know, with the persona. Mm. So, but that makes sense as you're describing it there. That's, and it's more liberating in a way. You're liberating yourself from your constraints. Well, without being too judgmental of my own self, I think your way of perceiving it is probably the more normal human way of seeing it. <laughs> um, I have quite a, I have quite a strange relationship with my creativity. It doesn't feel like it's of me, and that's that. Um, so. So, yeah, so I think your response is probably the more normal response to that thing. And um, I could understand why you would you would struggle with that question, therefore, if you're seeing yourself as being and creativity as being part of the same thing. Yeah. 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 yeah that's great. Thank you. <laughs> you're very welcome. Any other questions? OK. Um, so I was wanting to do a little um a little exercise with you from the book, um, which I've come back to time and time and time again, which is thinking about what I call in the book the creative way. Um, but it's thinking about yourself in relationship to it and thinking about your lineage of creativity and what has come through to you. So we've we've seen that on the collective, what came through to us about women's creativity was shockingly small. And yet we all have a lineage. Can you hear those dogs going apeshit in the background? There's about five dogs all howling at once. Um, our creative lineage, where we come from, who's influenced us, whose shoulders we stand on. Because often these things are kind of slightly unconscious and when we're feeling uninspired, we can go into our small selves of I'm all alone and I'm not inspired. Whereas actually when we can reach back and reach out towards what inspires us, it's far easier to get the creative juices flowing again because we look at work that we love, women or men who really inspire and motivate us and we're like, oh yeah, and then suddenly all the ideas start tumbling again. So I would love you to respond to this however you want. I mean, I tend to do it with word and image. So I will write some things and draw other things and kind of make it diagrammatic. But this is up to you, however you want to put this information on a piece of paper so it's meaningful to you. So the first question is, where do you come from? Because the creative way didn't start with you in this moment now. It came from somewhere and is coming through you. So where do you come from geographically? What are your influences in terms of the land that you live in now and the land that you were born into?
where do you come from in terms of family? So it might be genetic family or greater family, family of adoption, family that you've chosen. But the sorts of influences, creative influences on your life. It's often quite handy to name the things that people did. So if they were a writer or if they were a gardener or worked with fabric, it's quite handy to just make note of those different things they worked with. Something that I've, this is a side note, something that I've noticed, I'm recording the second, um, the second season of my podcast, Creative Magic at the moment. And it's really interesting asking women that kind of, where do you come from creatively thing? Because a lot of them actually only in the conversation we're having suddenly realized that it was seeing a grandmother sewing or a great grandmother that the fabric went through the family, that actually that's where they got their absolute love of fabric. And actually they were looking, one of them was looking back in a family tree and saw that the furthest person back that they got an occupation for was a seamstress. And here she was 300 years later working with fabric. And so that sort of thing can go through family lines. We both learn the skills and we're exposed to it in our families of origin, but also as something on a kind of a deeper level that's running through families, a certain skill, a certain love. It's really important, especially if you have tricky relationships with your family members. It's really important to know what they did and what they loved because often we see those threads coming through and they can be a real key to our own, unlocking our own creative powers. Culturally, where do you come from culturally in terms of what was the overarching culture, the music, the books, the art that were around as you were growing up, the big influences? the films or songs that were big, the big cultural events that you went to as a child. Another big form of influence is our intellectual influence. So the, the authors and thinkers, philosophers, poets, who just speak to our souls, who speak our language, and we carry their wisdom with us. We come back to their wisdom again and again. People who opened our minds. Who are your people? Visually, what has had a massive influence on you visually? So who are your favorite artists, filmmakers? Who, whose work sets you alight or creates worlds that just create such possibility and magic for you? Whose use of color do you adore?
in terms of sound, what, what are the big songs in your life? What are the lyrics that have shaped you? These are all things that you'll be able to add to. In the, I know ideas are going to come to you as you're falling asleep tonight or when you're in the shower tomorrow. You'll be like, oh, yeah, I've got to add that one. Do keep adding to it. It's not a five minute task, but it's a really important thing to come back to again and again. And then if you can. Go out and collect things that represent those things. So it might be a piece of clothing that is a color that you love. It might be a book about an artist that you love. It might be listening to that song that shaped your life. Whatever it is, gather up as many of those bits as you can and put them in one place. So I call this making an altar. You don't have to be in any way spiritual or religious. It's simply gathering the energy of a variety of things with one intention, which is these are the roots of my creativity. This is what inspires me. This is what I come from. And having it in one place together. And then enjoy them. Look through the book. Get a greetings card of, you know, one of the paintings that you love. Have it there so that you're seeing it every day. So that these things are constantly stimulating and inspiring you. If we don't have any more questions, I'm going to be open to questions. I will finish us off by reading a little bit more. The creatrix is not simply a performer or entertainer, but these are elements of what she does. She is a dedicated shaper of consciousness and energy, a culture weaver a dreamer and midwife of new worlds. She is an asker of uncomfortable questions and a liver of taboos in a world that expects conformity. She is answerable to her own intuition and sense of authenticity and to the work itself. She follows the call of her soul above the demands of the world she knows herself more deeply and sees herself more clearly through her work. To be a creatrix is to dedicate oneself to the cycle of creativity, to embodying soul through impregnation, gestation, birth, nurturing and death in a way that is not really understood in our culture. It is to consciously engage directly with the forces of the universe on a daily basis. The creatrix gestates her own content and births it out. Her art is an expression of her inner world and a reflection of what she has sensed in the outer world. Through this sacred birthing, she is transformed, as are those who witness the process or its products. In this sense of the create act of creative expression, is a sacred act of communion for the community. The final bit I want to finish on is just this. Often it can feel, or we can be made to feel, that being creative is a hobby is you know a nice little thing to give a little bit of our time to, but it's rather self-indulgent and it doesn't really matter. And what I want to remind you of is this. I don't believe that creativity is a one-way street. I think that this creative energy has intelligence and purpose. The creative way is a real thing, a living thing, and it's longing for you 
as much as you're longing for it. You, dear one, are one of its chosen points of expression. It's time to honour that gift more fully. There we are. Thank you so much for being with me this evening. And I feel filled up. <laughs> and yes, please do. If you want to um, watch the replay of it or share it with anybody, it, the recording will be sent out tomorrow and it'll be on the Woman Craft Publishing YouTube channel. So it will be there available. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Lucy. I feel filled up too. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Thanks. Bye. Thank you Not very much. much. Take care. Bye.